Let me say welcome to Bite Size Theology. Today we're looking at the doctrine of God's sovereignty and part one, our sovereign creator. We've got 30 minutes and the time starts now. And the first thing I want to say is that um, the doctrine of God's sovereignty is about God being the king or about God being in charge of the world. We don't often use the word sovereign except occasionally to talk about Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. She is our sovereign but it just means she is uh, in charge. Now, of course, that isn't really true. I mean, Buckingham Palace, we, we love her, we like listening to the Queen's speech um, on Christmas Day, but she's not actually practically in charge of our lives. In God's case, it doesn't just mean that he's the figurehead monarch, it means he's actually the one who controls the details of the universe and the details of our lives. And um, the fact that God is um, sovereign is connected to the fact that he is creator, and actually God alone is creator. And that is the reason why he's ultimately in charge. So um, I put down the first point on the handout. God the Trinity created the world without Satan and without us. I don't mean that God made the world without Satan in it. I mean God made the serpent and the reptiles. God made human beings. We're in the world. But that God created the world without anyone else's help. Without anyone else's influence. God the creator was the only one who decided how the world would be. So, you know, in deciding how fast should the earth spin on its axis and how long should a day last, God decided 24 hours. And nobody else influenced that decision. When deciding where to put Mont Blanc and choosing it would be somewhere in the middle of this landmass called Europe, God is the only one who chose that. When deciding that human beings would have and five fingers on each hand and five toes on each foot, um, rather than six or something. God was the one who decided that. Because no one else was involved in the decision because no one else was there. When God created the universe, he was the only one existing and the only one deciding. And we see that all over the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Before there was anything else, there was God and then he spoke creation into existence. Or in John chapter 1, um, we read that in the beginning was the Word, the Lord Jesus. The Word was with God. The Word was, was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing is made that has been made. So the whole of reality can be divided into two categories. Either it's the creator, which is him, or it's the stuff that he created which is us and the world and Satan and all of the angels and everything else. In fact, in Colossians, it becomes even more explicit that not only did he create the physical world, but he also created the, um, the spiritual world. So we read in Colossians chapter 1 about Jesus, that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. So that just tells us right at the beginning, it's not as if this world is jointly ruled by God and Satan, as if they kind of fight it out to see which one of them is going to be in charge each moment. And sometimes Satan wins and sometimes God wins. At the beginning, the world was not jointly created by God and Satan. It was created by God only. And the spiritual powers did not exist at the beginning. God made them. There was only one creator, so only one person called the shots. Or should I say, only three persons called the shots, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and similarly, it wasn't as if the, the universe is a collaboration between God's decisions and our decisions. Like my free will decides some things, and God's sovereignty decides other things. At the beginning, there were no humans. There were no human decisions. There was only God's decision. So at the start, God is the only creator, and so he's the only uncontested sovereign. And then the Bible tells us that the universe continues to work like that. So God didn't just make the world at the start, but he sustains the world moment by moment. Everything depends on him. So Colossians 1 goes on to say, verse 17, He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And each moment of existence, gravity only continues to be gravity. Uh, light only continues to, to travel at the speed of light because God decides to sustain the universe in being. 
in that way. Hebrews chapter 1 says the same thing. Jesus sustains all things by his powerful word. Dependent on the words of Jesus moment by moment. Now at this point I want to introduce one of the principles that we keep seeing in bite-sized theology. Namely that all of theology is interconnected. So what we believe about the, um, the nature of God's control over the world is connected to what we believe about God as the creator of the world. So the doctrine of creation and the doctrine of God's sovereignty or control are connected. And in fact, they're also connected to what we think about human beings. How much control do we have? What is our place in the world? Well, we're dependent on God. Our existence is contingent on him. So we need to understand who God is, who we are, how we relate according to the doctrine of creation, according to the doctrine of God's sovereignty. Now, really, that sets it all up. God's the only creator, he's the only sustainer. But then we're going to see that God is in charge of absolutely everything. And all I'm going to do today, in this first session on the subject of sovereignty, is just to go through different areas of life, and I'm going to say, and God's in charge of that as well. And God's in charge of that as well. And that is a very simple point. God is in charge of everything. Um, and I'm just going to take my time by going through a few areas. So firstly, God is in charge of the natural world. Um, Jesus' words in, John, in Matthew chapter 6 on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says this. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Um, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil or spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added to you. Now, Jesus teaches here that God is in charge of every time a bird eats. Now, that is not something you hear from David um, uh, Attenborough. You see birds foraging and birds hunting, and, and he maybe talks about how good they are at their eyesight. You know, peregrine falcons can read newspaper print from a, um, a mile in the sky, whatever the statistic is. But he doesn't say, oh, a peregrine falcon eats when God feeds it. But according to Jesus... Uh, the birds eat the same as, you know, my dog eats. I put out some food for him and he eats the food. And God puts out some food for the birds and they eat the food. <coughs> or about, how about um, flowers? Great. So the biologist can tell us about cell division um, at the axon in the, um, somewhere in the, in the plant and how the cells divide and they grow and etc. And the DNA is expressed in the various petals. That's true. That's a good description of what's happening biologically. But a description of what's happening theologically is that God is sustaining that biological process and producing the petals to clothe the flowers. And Jesus says, don't you realise that the whole natural world is dependent for its existence, moment by moment, on a generous God? And then Jesus makes his point. He says, well, God feeds the birds, he clothes the flowers, but he cares more for you than for birds and flowers. So don't worry about what you will eat, because the God who feeds the birds will feed you. And don't worry about what you will bear, wear, because the, the God who clothes the lilies will clothe you. Now that isn't just somebody saying, what shall I wear, because I can't decide what outfit to wear for the party on Saturday. This is a society saying, what should we wear, because we don't know if we've got any food. Um, sorry, we don't know if we've got any clothes for the winter. What will we eat, we don't know if we've got any food. Um, and yet Jesus says, depend on God, because he's in charge. Um, meals are not accidents. Uh, they come from your Heavenly Father. He controls the harvest. He controls what you have each day. And, and then Jesus gives another analogy, a couple of pages over, Matthew chapter 10, verse 29. This is my favourite one. Jesus is trying to comfort worried disciples again. And he says this time, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground 
apart from the will of your Father. Even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore, you're of more value than many sparrows. Well, in my case, the numbering of the hairs on my head is less impressive than for some of you. But the point is that God knows the number um, and that God decides the death of every sparrow. God decides the life and death of every human being. Now, I love to think about this for a moment because how in charge of the world would you need to be to control the death of every sparrow? So just think of some of the ways that sparrows have died in the last 24 hours. And I want, um, I want people in the room to, to feed in some suggestions. So how have sparrows died in the last 24 hours? Can anyone think of a, um, a possible sparrow death? Gunshot. Gunshot. Okay, so God's got to be in charge of everyone shooting sparrows and how accurate their marksmanship is. Any others? Cats, yeah. God's got to be in charge of every cat in the world, maybe every cat owner in the world, um, whether they've bought delicious cat food like Whiskers or some inferior brand, and, and whether the cat flap has been set on the cat can go out or the cat can stay in setting. And because um, in order to, char- to be in control of every sparrow that dies by cat, you've got to be in charge of every cat owner and their behaviour. What else? Foxes. Foxes, yeah. So the foraging or the hunting behaviour of every fox. Anyone think of any really creative ones? Lightning. Uh, okay, lightning. God, God controls the lightning, yeah. Um, double glazing. And that's the dead sparrow. So every double glazing salesman in the world and how convincing they were and when the double glazing got fitted and the window cleaners and how thoroughly they did it and the angle of the sun on the window. All these things affect whether a sparrow hits the window or not. Jet engines. They get sucked into the propellers. So every air traffic controller of the world, even just to decide the death of every sparrow, you see, God's got to be in charge of absolutely everything. Fertiliser. Fertiliser. It kills insects that sparrows eat. Fertiliser kills the insects that sparrows eat. So you've got to be in charge of every farmer in the world and which fertiliser he uses. Thank you. Uh, Let's stop there. So (laughs) just to be in charge of sparrow deaths, you've actually got to be in charge of everything. And that's what Jesus means. You know, God is in charge of everything. Not one sparrow falls to the ground except by the will of your Father. And your hairs on your head are numbered. Don't worry, you're more valuable than many sparrows. Maybe you've heard the little poem, said the sparrow to the robin. I would really like to know why these fretful human beings rush about and worry so. Said the robin to the sparrow, friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father, such as cares for you and me. In other words, that the sparrows know this. They look to to God to give them their food in due time. But we struggle to believe it because we don't have this view that God is sovereign. Where does your food come from? We think Tesco. I mean, yeah, maybe that's where you bought it. But it comes from my heavenly father. He's the one who sustained the crops that grew the food. He's the one who sustained the existence of the lorry driver who drove the food from the farm to the distribution centre. He's the one who sustains the life of the person at the checkout and who scanned your loaf of bread as you went to the checkout. He's the, um, even though we can describe the processes, and biologically we can say why it is that flowers grow, that doesn't mean that we've explained away the agency of God who is involved in feeding us and providing for us. And I think we've, we've actually taken on a worldview from the secularists where we think a lot of things happen just by quote unquote natural causes. And the Bible says there's no such thing as natural causes. Everything is supernatural. Everything that happens is sustained by Jesus. And without Jesus, nothing would exist. And it's what Christians of the past used to call providence, which is just, um, if you say provide, and then but ends at the end, I say it quickly, providence, providence. In other words, God is providing things. I remember on holiday a few years ago, um, we were treating ourselves because it was holiday, so we bought some extra luxury strawberry jam. Instead of buying the you know, Sainsbury's Economy strawberry jam, we bought Bon Maman strawberry jam, which has actual whole strawberries in it. And as my friend Chris was um, spooning out a whole strawberry onto his toast, he said, thank you, Father, for this strawberry that you grew for this breakfast. And I thought that's a lovely way of thinking about it, because, of course, God is sovereign. 
And as this little strawberry was growing in a strawberry bush somewhere in a market garden in Kent or wherever it was, God had intended this strawberry will bless my son Chris on his breakfast on holiday. And often we just forget that. We forget to see God's hand in everything. We think I just got it from Sainsbury's or from Tesco. God's in charge of the natural world. God's in charge of random events or apparently random events. Actually, there are no such thing as random events because God decides the outcome of the supposedly random. So Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but the decision or the outcome is from the Lord. You roll the dice, but God decides what number comes up. So on that day when you're doing, um, is it Monopoly where you have to throw a six to start and you just never throw a six, you throw like, you know, 30, you throw the dice 30 times and it's never a six. Well, you know, God's decided that, that he'll test your patience on that day. It's not random, it's in God's hands. Which is why um, at various point places in the Bible, um, people cast dice and God controls the outcome. So they want to find out um, who is responsible for the great storm on the boat in Jonah chapter 1. And they um, cast lots and it turns out to be Jonah. Because God controls the lots so that Jonah um, is revealed. God's in charge of random events. One of my friends said, there's no such thing as coincidences. There's only God instances, which is corny, but it is true. Uh, God's in charge of the natural world. God's in charge of random events. God's in charge of human lives, the details of human lives. He chooses what happens in your life, where you live, when you die, what happens each day. So um, in Hannah's song at the beginning of 1 Samuel, um, Hannah sings this. She sings, the Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to shale and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts up the needy from the ash heap and so on. And our circumstances are in God's hands. He decides when we live, when we die, whether we're rich or whether we're poor. Now, um, I love how um, when we do hymns on Sunday, I don't know if you know this, but often the old hymns, Sometimes they had some dodgy verses which we no longer sing, and then over the course of the ages we just select the, the best verses. But if you really go hunting on the internet, you can find the lost and hidden verses. So one of my favourite ones is from God Save the Queen, and it goes something like this. And my, may thy marshal wait, he by thy mighty aid victory bring. May he sedition hush, and like a torrent rush, rebellious Scots to crush. God save the Queen. And I'm looking at Naomi there. And, um, you know, it's obviously not very politically correct now to talk about crushing the rebellious Scots, but that was one of the original verses of God save the Queen. Um, or um, another one, in All Things Bright and Beautiful, if you ever sung that at school, the rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate. God made them high and lowly and ordered their estate. Bum, bum, bum. And again, you know, maybe that was written to keep the, the poor downtrodden and to um, preserve the aristocracy. But it is true that God does decide who lives in the castle and who is poor and homeless at the gate. It doesn't mean that God favours the rich. So there's a story about exactly this in the Bible, isn't there? A rich man and a poor man sprawled at his gate, um, and that poor man was called Lazarus, and we discover that later that that, and that poor man is favoured by God and ends up in, in heaven, whereas the rich man ends up in hell. So it's not saying God loves rich people more than poor people, but God does decide whether we're rich or poor. He's in charge of our lives and our circumstances. In Acts chapter 17, Paul is talking to a bunch of pagans who don't know about God. They've never heard about the one God. He's the creator of everything. But Paul tells them God determined the exact places set for us where we should live. So the fact that these people live in Athens was God's decision that they should live in Athens, even though they didn't even know this God existed. He's in control of their lives. Or Psalm 139, this is an amazing verse. The whole psalm actually is about God's control of the world. But Psalm 139 verse 16 says, All the days of my life were written in your book, even before one of them came to be. So God's got a diary of your life, and it's a really comprehensive diary, and it's got everything in it. I think in my diary, the, the furthest ahead I've got is some, I've got one thing in two years' time. 
that God knows my diary for 10 years' time, 20 years' time. He's got every day in it. In my diary, sometimes I plan something, I've got to cross it out, because it turns out not to happen, especially recently with COVID. But in God's story, he's got the actual final diary for every day of my life, with exactly what is going to happen, even before any of it has happened. It's an amazing verse, isn't it? In your book, I recorded all the days ordained for me before one of them came to be. God's diary. And so God's in charge, that's comforting. And, but the flip side of it is we're not in charge. Uh, we don't decide our plans. We, we make plans, but we can't tell whether they'll happen or not. But God's plans do happen. And so there's that rebuke in the book of James, James chapter 4. Listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city, carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're just a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag, and all such boasting is evil. Now, um, James is saying that you, you ought to sit a little bit looser to your plans, because it just depends what God wants to happen. And what you want to happen might not happen. You should say, if the Lord wills. And um, Christians of a past age used to sometimes write, taking this seriously, this verse, they used to sometimes write the letters DV after any appointment in the church calendar. And I think DV is, stands for the Latin Deo Valente or something like that. God willing, basically. So if God wills, God willing. Like we could say that the next Sunday service at Grace Church Greenwich is at 10.30 in the morning at the Old Royal Naval College. DV, as in, we think it is, we're planning for it to be, but of course it's up to God, whether it is. I mean, the Royal Naval College could be struck by lightning, or it could be um, closed for COVID, or, you know, a load of things could happen, but we're just making the plans tentatively subject to God's will that we'll do that. And it's a good little reminder, maybe in your own diary you want to just put DV, I, I think I'll do this, but of course it's up to God what actually happens. So God is in charge of the natural world. God's in charge of random events, so-called random events. No such thing as coincidences, only God instances. God's in charge of human lives. God's in charge even, and this is where it gets a bit closer to home. God is in charge even of human decisions. Because that's the bit that sometimes people say, look, surely I want to have free will, and we'll think about this a bit more in a couple of weeks' time, but to give me free will, surely God's got to leave a little bit of the universe that he doesn't control and he lets me control. So um, you know, my decision about what I'm going to do is that's for me to choose. And so maybe God carves out a little area where he lets go of the reins so that I can hold the reins. And the Bible disagrees. Now, the Bible says even the things that I choose, God is in charge of my choices. So Proverbs 21, verse 1. The heart of the king is like a watercourse in the hand of the Lord. He directs it wherever he will. So um, I, um, I want you to imagine, in fact, I want you to do this. Next time you wash your hands, um, I want you to try and get the, the water to come here. And um, by just moving your fingers, see if you can get the trickle of water to go between those fingers and then those fingers, then those fingers, then those fingers, and then back again. So you basically get it to go one, two, three, four, three, two, one. You get it to get. Um, this will take longer to wash your hands, um, but please actually do it because then every time you wash your hands for the next week, you're going to think of Proverbs twenty-one verse one. And, and as you do that, it will just require the tiniest little movement of your muscle to move the watercourse, and think that is how easily God changes the mind of the king. Um, it's, just, it's that easy for God to change the mind of um, Joe Biden or Vladimir Putin or Boris Johnson. It's just with a little twitch um, of God's hand. Um, in Exodus chapter 34, um, the Israelites are told that three times a year they need to go up to Jerusalem to worship God, three festivals. And all of the men in Israel need to do that. And you think about it for a moment, you think this is a an absolute disaster in terms of the security of the nation. Like, for all the men to abandon the border controls, all the people in the army to leave their posts and come to Jerusalem, I mean, surely someone's going to attack. 
And then God says in Exodus 34, verse 24, don't worry, no one will covet your land on those three times a year when you come to worship. Now notice what he says here. He doesn't just say, no one will successfully invade your land. He goes further than that. He says, no one will even want to invade your land. No one will covet your land. And like, well, God, how do you know that? Well, because God's in charge of what they think. I will make sure that they don't think that they want to invade, says God. It's just assumed that God is in charge of human decisions. God's in charge of everything. And then maybe the hardest case of all, God is even in charge of evil. Um, God's in charge of evil, although he does not do evil. Um, there is an enemy, there is a, a, a Satan, um, and yet Satan is on God's leash. He can only do the things that God allows him to do. And there's lots of examples in the Bible of evil things that God forces to conform to his plans. Even though God does not approve of the evil thing itself. And two classic examples, or central examples. Uh, the first one at the end of the book of Genesis, where do you remember that Joseph's brothers are, um, are um, envious of him, they, they despise him, and so they sell him into slavery. And he goes off to, as a slave into Egypt. And their purposes are evil. It's their hatred of their brother that causes them to do it. But it, it works out really well because Joseph goes to Egypt. He rises up through the Egyptian civil service. He becomes friends with the Pharaoh. And then a bit later on there's a famine and there's no food in Israel. And Joseph is able to negotiate um, shelter for the Israelites because of the good position he has in Egypt. It all works out really well, even though it started really badly. And then um, Joseph summarises in, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, for the saving of many lives. The, the same event, you had an evil purpose, God didn't have an evil purpose, but through the same event, God in his sovereignty purposed and planned a good outcome. It's true of Jason, but then it's true of the probably the most evil event. What is the most evil thing that ever, has ever happened in the history of the world? Surely the murder of the Son of God by people that he had created. And yet we read in the book of Acts that even though those people who crucified Jesus did so for evil intent, and yet they did exactly what God had planned and predestined would take place. See, God's in charge of the event. He ordained and orchestrated the event. Um, he didn't do it with evil intention. God does not do evil. But he worked through the evil intention of others to bring about his good plan. And by the time you've added evil into the mix, there really is nothing in the universe that is outside his control. Uh, the natural world, random events, human lives, human decisions even, even evil human decisions. All things are conformed to the purpose of his will. And what does that mean? What's the outcome of that? Well, it means that God is much higher than we thought, much bigger than we thought. And humans play much less of a role than we thought. It's quite humbling. We do not decide our destiny, even though we're told constantly in every Hollywood film that we do. We do not decide the future. God decides the future. We play very little role in shaping the outcome of human civilization. That is God's decision. It's very humbling for human beings. It's very exalting for God. But ultimately, it's very comforting because the universe is in the hands of a good Heavenly Father who loves to provide for us what we need. Thank you for listening to Bite Size Theology. For more resources to help you get to know God better through his word, including GracePod and answers to big questions, do check out www.greenwich.church.